my god! It's Freebo! Oh, they look so cool! In game mode! Hey, Five Nights at Freddy's. Ah! Oh! Music Man! Wait, why is that? Wait, this looks great! She's freaking dead, dude! Uh, give me it, give me it! Freddy! Freddy, you bitch! Uh, Freddy, Freddy, Freddy! There's no mods! I'm just trying to beat the game! I am. Fuck! Leave me alone! Let me start off with a question. Why do people love FNAF? I don't think I need to start this review by going over the history of Five Nights at Freddy's. It's about haunted animatronics who want to kill. Also, there is this purple guy who is evil. His name is William Afton, but his character is further developed in this book called Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes. Actually, is it the purple guy? Who is this pink guy? Why is this guy called the purple guy? Is he literally purple? Jokes aside, it is fair to assume viewers watching this have at least a basic understanding of this franchise. Therefore, I won't be going into much exposition in this video. Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach is undoubtedly the most divisive and controversial entry in this franchise. I will be the first to admit that the FNAF franchise is a guilty pleasure of mine. I have been following this franchise from start to finish and have seen all of its progress. I feel this puts me in a unique position than most reviewers. I fall in all categories that these games branch out to. First, you have the hardcore fans who will eat up the story in every little detail about it. You have observers and critics who will judge the games not based on any love of the series, but rather through an honest assessment of the gameplay mechanics. And finally, the last category. Younger fans, like myself, to whom these games are technically appealing. Not everybody necessarily falls into only one of these hats. Some may fall under two, but I'd argue very few fall under all three. Although this review is not for the fan of heart, this is without question the most thorough review Review I have ever made. You will have heard some of my points elsewhere because guess who's late to the party? But I plan to present new topics that give further clarity to the nature of this game. In addition, being late to the party has also led me to be able to sit on the game more and cogitate my thoughts. So without further ado... The unveiling of Security Breach can be dated back to this March 29th article on Variety.com, which seriously, out of all the news publications Steel Wool could have partnered with, Variety, do any of you read Variety.com? Do most of you even know Variety.com exists? In this interview, Steel Wool outlined some of the design decisions and work being put into, at the time, newest entry to the FNAF franchise, Help Wanted. At the end of the article, it states how Scott Cawthon was happy with the work of Help Wanted and showed a desire to work on a new FNAF title with Steel Wool. Five Nights at Freddy's Help Wanted was a VR game that, for the most part, remade many of the classic games in a VR experience, with some new fresh experiences here or there. Steel Wool previously had worked on other VR games. One of their founders is an ex-Pixar animator for Christ's sake. So in Scott's eyes, they fit the bill. Help Wanted to many is their favorite FNAF game, and I don't blame anyone for thinking it. Still, it has many annoying design elements that make the experience worse for me personally. Trust me, there is a point to all of this. I know this is a security breach video, but let's see what Steel Wool got right and wrong. The visuals and animations are superb, and the high refresh rate of VR makes these characters flow smooth as butter. Um, something not cool about the look is how they change the models. Yeah, many models had their shades of colors changed or the textures had an overhaul. I get it that it isn't as easy as Control C and Control V Scott's models into Unreal. However, some general imperfections go far enough to bother me. It seems odd that they would straight up change some of the construction of the models, possibly to make animating them easier, I suppose. But a couple of examples include the Springtrap model and the Toy Bonnie model, in which they stretch out his teeth to give him buck teeth because that's the Steel Wool way! The Phantoms just look dumb. You see what I'm seeing, right? Like, sometimes you can't quite describe why the models look off. Speaking of models, many do not exist in the game! In FNAF 1, there is no Golden Freddy, which is like, okay, I can excuse that to a certain extent. But then in FNAF 2, there are no Withers, which is baffling to the highest degree. They also try to get away with using FNAF 1 Foxy instead of the Withered Foxy in the FNAF 2 levels. Nice. And is this me? Or did this original image used for the Night 2 screen look 
like a fan-made Foxy model. And when they did eventually add the Withers, they added Wither Foxy, because I sure wasn't going to let them use FNAF 1 Foxy and call it a day. But the rest of the Withers were simply subjected to their own single night mode. Another fact that most people forgot when the game initially launched, but this game was a buggy mess. Funtime Freddy would just like freeze into place, and I still don't quite 100% know how this game is supposed to work even today. There are some other little nitpicks, like how there is very little FNAF 6 representation, but overall, Help Wanted is a good game. I really enjoyed its gameplay elements, even if some design decisions didn't make a ton of sense. Such as reusing the FNAF 3 breathing sound effect in the animatronic repair minigames. Really? Fast forward to August 8th, 2019. FNAF had turned 5 years old, which if you're like me and have been keeping up with all the games since the very beginning, you know that fact makes you feel really old inside. This teaser was posted on goodoldscottgames.com. It depicted Freddy and the gang in an 80s inspired mall, and this is what got people talking. But in my opinion, it wasn't much to get too hyped about. It's just early concept art. We barely had anything to go off of, but it was slated for a 2020 release date. Nice. We got a trailer one year later with zero gameplay. Okay, so Scott had to clarify that they had to delay the game to an early 2021 release date, which was 100% understandable. But I still was a bit nervous. The same thing happened with FNAF VR. Scott stated how their initial vision had expanded to a much bigger game, and the same thing seemed to have been happening here as well. So Scott and the gang shouldn't have promised a release date, or someone at Steelwool needs to work on better project management skills. They also released this NVIDIA RTX trailer that revealed nothing new, and it came out in January, which I don't know about you, but January definitely falls under early 2021. But during all of this, we yet hit another conundrum. When you push back a game, there are a handful of downsides, one of which is that it's hard to push back and reschedule the other moving parts like marketing and of course, toys. Yeah, Security Breach received a whole batch of figures and plushies to coincide with its release. The problem being, they were announced with press photos about 8 months before the first gameplay trailer. Funko moment! This left a sour taste in many people's mouths, including me. One interesting note is that this led to fans to speculate about the gameplay with this poster, particularly sealing the deal. This poster of a young security guard with the word protect was posted on scottgames.com. At the very least, this unnamed character was obviously implied to be acting as some sort of protagonist or a playable character. In February of 2021, we finally received our first trailer, and oh boy does it qualify as a trailer. Like, it's okay, and in retrospect, I think it was a good trailer, but the game was supposed to come out in early 2021, and Scott even specifically said that he made a clear distinction in his Reddit post, and we saw like, what, two seconds of gameplay, and for 1.7 of those seconds, the game was stuttering. Ah, yes, captured on PS5, and yet the game cannot handle sewers and walking in the main entrance. I also thought it was a weird design choice to replicate and parody the FNAF 1 and 2 trailers. This just felt weird. The voice at the beginning and end of the trailer got people speculating. When I first found you, you were nothing. You will do as I say! You will bring me what I want! Who were these characters? What part did they have in the game? What if I told you that these voices were the same character and they didn't even appear in the game? More on that later. And some of the lighting. Oof. So maybe this wasn't the best way to start the year, but it's alright. This was an early trailer. Perhaps the next trailer will make up for it. So in October of 2021, Jesus Christ! What happened in the middle of these trailers? Did they forget they were making a video game with massive hype around it? We got a release date of December 16th. Uh oh. So call me over dramatic, but this was not a good sign. So up to this point, we have established that Steel Wool has a track record of delaying releases. Releasing games in a buggy state, lousy marketing. Did I even mention Freddy and Friends? Just bad. I think it's cute and charming, but judging it from an actual marketing perspective, oh ho, this is not it. I'm excited about the new Five Nights at Freddy's game because it will have spooky black octopus-like tentacles. Also, remember a bit ago when I said Stu Wool may have had bad project management skills? Another thing to be concerned about is how the trailers have drastically different tones from one another. This was not good to say the least, and I would be lying if I said a December 16th release date was worrisome. Like, you say late 2021, and then you release it in the last week you possibly could. Yeah, they could have released it later technically, but Steel Wool just couldn't miss the opportunity for kitties to ask their parents for the new Five Nights at Freddy's game coming to Steam on December 16th with a $39.99 price tag. And it wasn't even labeled as horror on the Steam page. Okay, this is a security breach review. Let's get on with that. 
What a gift to relish. A victim that can't perish. Security Breach opens up with a cinematic cutscene showcasing all the characters performing, and this is pretty good. It is really well animated, and they pulled off this 80s VHS aesthetic, which I think turned out really well. Introducing us to Roxy, Monty, Chica, and Freddy Fazbear himself. What is this, the 12th Freddy? We got a little story about how Freddy collapsed onto the stage for some reason. Will we ever find out why? Well, no. We cut back to Freddy inside his room, and apparently there's a child in him. Okay. What a way to open up. Boy inside stomach. His name is Gregory, who will be the main protagonist we follow through the rest of the game. Gregory is a small boy in the pizza plex, and yeah, context and fleshing out the details isn't really a thing in this game. Though here is something you've heard elsewhere and is an unoriginal point, but I have to mention it anyways. The chemistry between these two is fun. I mean, is it anything for generations to remember? Yes. The fact that when Gregory sees the rabbit lady and Freddy goes off describing what a fountain is, that's just sweet. Though, Gregory doesn't really talk like his age, which isn't the best from an immersion standpoint. But Jesus, do you know how many people complained about this? And do you know what they would be complaining about more? If Gregory was actually written like an eight-year-old, he would just be crying and obnoxious the whole time. Though, please, Steel Wool, why did you make Gregory too unassuming? He doesn't question anything around him. Give him some more reaction or emotion. He's literally being hunted down for Christ's sake. The general gameplay loop of this game consists of us roaming the pizza plex with all the lights on. That electricity bill must be suffering hard for Fazbear Entertainment, and we'll have to uncover the horrors of Freddy Fazbear's pizza once again as those dang darn robots are after Gregory. Gregory, right off the bat, explains to Freddy that he's got a bad feeling about both Vanessa and the robots scattered about. Vanessa is this security guard that I'm sure you've seen memes about her, but we'll get back to her in a bit. Freddy asks Gregory why he is so hesitant, and Gregory refuses to answer clearly. Do we ever get further context on why the animatronics are out to get Gregory? I'm just gonna stop with this bit. This is a Five Nights at Freddy's game after all. One of this game's unique gameplay mechanics is the ability to jump inside Freddy's tummy wummy and roam around the place in an indestructible and untraceable state. This makes the game kinda boring, but whatever. For example, if an area is too hard, oh Freddy! To combat this, Freddy only has a certain amount of charge, which is wildly inconsistent. In areas like the beginning here, yeah, he's basically got an infinite charge. However, later in the game, the battery goes down fast faster than the credibility of the Bloc Quebecois. Just a bit immersion breaking. We also get introduced to some of the tools at our disposal, including the Faz Watch. This includes not one, but two useless features. All right, a map sounds cool right? Where are the markers? Seriously, this is it. Except for the little legend pointing out such useful locations such as stairs, it doesn't get much better than this. And when you try to check out the map within the pizza plex, I think I forgot to put my contacts in today. Then the cameras. After an extremely underwhelming chase scene, nice speed there bucko, we get access to the cameras. And these are, uh, these are kind of useless. Cameras are a Five Nights at Freddy's staple. Unless it's FNAF 4. We don't talk about FNAF 4. PewDiePie wasn't scared. What's so great about the cameras in the original Click Team FNAF games is how they added to the game setting. I'd sometimes find myself staring at cameras, looking at the elements that make up a room. Security Breach takes the camera system and does nothing with them. In other FNAF games, you have to use the cameras to combat other animatronics, like the puppet in FNAF 2 or Springtrap in FNAF 3. Heck, if we want to go further with this, the entered boss fight in Sister Location had cameras play a large part. But in this game, they just they're just kind of useless. You really don't need to go through the game without ever using them. What if there were specific puzzles you could only solve using the cameras? Maybe you could find secret areas using them, but no! And not to mention, not to get ahead of myself, especially since I wanted to keep this section to just but the cameras look like ass. Excuse me, but I'm pretty sure shadows exist on cameras too, you know. Speaking of drop mechanics, one of the other main gameplay elements of this game is the distraction mechanic. Interact with objects to distract the animatronics so you can get away. This is barely used again. Remember what I mentioned earlier? The game's whole premise is that the animatronics are now out to hunt Gregory, and he has to use the tools at his disposal to get away from them. But all of these mechanics, the cameras and the distraction gimmick are barely ever 
or used in any inventive or creative way. The only thing you can really use the distraction mechanic for are these little interactable elements throughout the map. Now, if you're like me, you just ignore these because the idea of distracting the animatronics rarely occurs because of its lack of usage. Hint, hint for you fellow players, this mechanic is totally broken. The animatronics will just like hover around whatever was interacted with and just kind of do their thing. They could literally walk past you and not attack you because, oh man, that shiny thing over there is moving. It's weird and more importantly, it's frustrating because another mechanic in this game, which is the main gameplay loop, is the stealth aspect. With the pizza plex being such a big place, there need to be ways to navigate around the building while being undetected. So, Security Breach incorporates a stealth system that consists of sprinting, crouching, and colored indicators. I love red light, green light. Basically, if you're moving too much, the animatronics will like hear you, I guess, and proceed to chase after you. Now, after this, you have a couple of options at your disposal. You can hide in one of the many hiding spots scattered around the map. You could use the distraction mechanic I mentioned earlier, or you can just run away. That one worked pretty much most of the time, I'd say. Say you have been observed, and there aren't many animatronics here to stop you. Now, yes, while three can be a lot to handle in an enclosed space, it's not a lot of variety. You can't have them teleporting to random parts of the map to act as enemies over and over again. We'll get back to them later. Steel Wool went to the drawing board and coughed up these things. Then someone pressed the copy button and pasted 500 of them across the map. Oops! These are the staff bots, which I can only assume stand for sophisticated, technologically advanced facility faction. They're like the Goombas of this game. They are scattered around everywhere and are generally a nuisance. Okay, so you know how like when designing stages in Mario Maker, limiting your Goombas to a certain amount to make the level coherently flow makes for a much more enjoyable experience. Security Breach is if you spammed 50 Goombas at the start of your level but then you actually spam Goombas through the rest of your level, so, so it's not even that fun. These staff bots are everywhere and become incredibly cumbersome quickly. You prance around and out of nowhere, Peekaboo! Look, in the beginning, the placement of the bots made sense. I actually did not want to get caught by them. They felt like a legitimate threat. However, Steel Wool just gave up and just placed them at will. They aren't even scary. In fact, they completely desensitize any horror in this game due to their frequent appearances. And you'd think these guys wouldn't be that hard to avoid. After all, their paths are telegraphed, right? Despite this, sometimes they can really just appear out of nowhere, whether you see it coming or not. And you want to know what happens when they find you? Teleportation has never been achieved, but in this world it has. They will call an animatronic to your location, but when I mean call, I mean teleport right next to you. This is straight up immersion breaking. I not only thought it was a little odd that I went to one area, but there was also animatronics. I go to another area and the same animatronics are there. Like really? Did Roxy really foxy swiggity swooty? I'm coming for that booty before me. But now, Steel Wool has implemented a system where they punish players in both a corrupt and unfair system. The staff bots' AI also extends to the core three animatronics because they aren't the brightest. These guys are kinda poopy. It is an effective option to simply run away, and their AI likely will just bug out. You can also hide in any of the hiding spots, and despite the game acting like the animatronics will be smart enough to tell if you've gone to hide right in front of them, in actual execution, you can hide right in front of them, and they'll act as if nothing happened. How did the little boy disappear right in front of me? Here's the thing though, the system that Steel will design was immediately doomed from the beginning. Undoubtedly, everyone has been clamoring for an open world FNAF game, but such a tall order brings many challenges. With the mall being so big, how is the player supposed to be challenged and feel threatened? Think of a game like The Joy of Creation, being coveted as the magnum opus of free roam FNAF fan games. If you really think about it, the 3D doesn't add a lot to the movement aspect. Of course, things like lighting, animations, and setting are greatly aided in the 3D environment, but you could tangibly remake this game in a 2D click team like setting. The problem with the free room idea is that in something like a pizzeria that's small and concise, developers can better tell where the player is going to be. While the actual exploration will surely be a lot more interesting in a mall, you won't get bored of the same setup as in a smaller establishment. It makes the game feel aimless because of it. This is the problem with the idea of a free room FNAF game. In my opinion, it's hard to not only balance out the AI of the animatronics, but you either feel like there wouldn't be enough or there is too much. I believe a happy middle could be a 
achieve, but I see no way what the scope Steel Wool wanted. To keep you on your toes, Steel Wool, even before this game was announced, had hyped up a character who was to be labeled as Vanny. She was first introduced in Help Wanted's Curse of Dreadbear DLC, was then vaguely mentioned here or there at FNAF's mobile game Special Delivery, and now has her grand appearance in this game. I'm not going to lie, I don't think I've ever been more unthreatened and underwhelmed by a villain in a video game. Heck, the villain in Mulan is more interesting. For God's sake, me, Bowser, I've posed more of a threat. This killer bunny girl is simply a textbook definition of wasted potential. I love her design. It takes everything wrong with Glitch Trap's design and fixes it. Taking the lifeless suits that made the original so iconic and making it an integral design detail while also adding to the mystery and spook factor of her character. She literally appears twice in this game and is barely mentioned. Not to jump the shark here, but at the end of the game, Freddy acts like Gregory has been on this grand adventure to stop Fanny, and that this is only the beginning. What are you talking about? Also, minor nitpick, there is a part in the game where you can find a secret area, and Freddy says the following. Fanny, it is very similar to Vanessa, and also Bunny. That cannot be a coincidence. Yeah, only Einstein could have come up with that conclusion. I agree. But this then unlocks a third option at the end called Vanny, which is a part of an alternative ending that I'll be sure to go over. By the way, if you've listened this far into the video, I appreciate that. But whether you find this area or not, Freddy still talks about Vanny. New players may not even know who Vanny is. How does Freddy know who she is if you don't find her hideout? Continuity is for losers. Though this animation for Vanny was pretty funny. What's she doing there dancing in place and then, oh my god, oh my god. The missions within Security Breach are such a mixed bag. Are you surprised? It's hard to categorize them because this game is defined by many fetch quests. The map and the menu don't label what story missions are, so it's like, Urgh. Here are some highlights. These FNAF 1 type callbacks are scattered about the game, which is a fantastic concept. However, it isn't really that fun since there isn't any tension associated with these parts of the game. For another example, when entering the basement, we find a load of endoskeletons and they act like the weeping angels from Doctor Who, which therefore act like the endoskeletons from the joy of creation. Come on guys. This part was visually engaging as it was actually dark for once. Who would have known? Not pulling a Luigi's Mansion 3 is the way to go. In addition, with the progression of losing access to Glamrock Freddy, the player actually feels vulnerable. There's a clear goal to be after. I mean, other than the fact that the section is piss easy. When we finally meet up with Freddy, we have to repair him, and in the process, we play a Simon Says minigame. May I ask? Is this fun? Just take the repair minigames and Help Wanted and elevate them a bit. Don't be going and removing all the gameplay from it. That's what this is. You also do this like three or four other times in the game, and it's always Simon Says. I feel bad for people who are colorblind. Late in the game, we get instructed to go up to the West Arcade and encounter DJ Music Band. Want to see a fun party trick? This section is pretty cool. Finding three levers to pull felt like a fetch quest, but with a chase scene accompanied by DJ Music Man. Except I wish they didn't spoil this part in the trailer. When I got to this section, I was like, he's a coming. Also, don't die, or you have to do everything over again. On the topic of Music Man, this little mini Music Man will appear in the vents to add some challenge. I mean, it's an acceptable inclusion, though I would have preferred if they chose another animatronic from the past to add more variety and representation. I feel like they were already designing DJ Music Man and wanted to save time on resources. So they just used the DJ Music Man model they had and then made the mini Music Man. On the topic of missions, how could I skip the sun and moon section? We get introduced to these characters pretty early on, and they are a treat to watch. This is only one of two sections where I felt the game was actually scary. Having the lights shut off with a menacing threat was a great start to the game. It rarely ever happened again, which was a shame. The only other time I can think of something as ominous and tense as this would be when we go deep underground of the sewers. This is during the part of the game where we have to destroy each animatronic and collect their respective parts to upgrade Freddy into his super Super Saiyan form, and this area's claustrophobic nature lends itself well to being a nice contrast from the super open mall. It also kind of reminds me of what made the original Five Nights at Freddy's so good. Trapped in an ominous atmosphere where you are defenseless in most situations, all cramped in a tiny location. It's just like, wow, this is an engaging, challenging, and legitimately frightening section of the game. This is why I question the base design of Security Breach as a game. If there were more enclosed sections like this, I would be singing a different tune.
There are two instances in the game where players can play little mini games to add some much needed gameplay shakeup to the base exploration. This being Monty Golf and Fazer Blast. Let's talk about the latter. Fazer Blast was fun. It's nothing crazy, but the buildup is pretty amusing. I like how the staff bot goes over all the rules and it reminds me a lot of real life laser tag. In this game, you more similarly play Capture the Flag, which is fine. It combines two games into one, though I think I would have preferred if Chica was in here. Just give me a small break, please. Later, when entering Monty Golf, by interacting with this arcade cabinet, you can play, well, Monty Golf. Why is this arcade cabinet the only one in the game that can be interacted with? Great question! Moving on, this is simply quite fun. The references to older games are superb, and overall is a nice break from the base gameplay. I had mentioned earlier that near the late game, the objective is to destroy all the animatronics and collect up the required animatronic part. After slaying one of these creatures, you would think they'd be extinguished from the world and can have their soul set free. See, that would be too easy. These guys are still like alive. I mean, Monty here is quite literally on his last legs. This is fine, but it leaves these guys' boss fights less satisfactory. Boss fights, I hear you say. So Steel Wool's definition of a boss fight may or may not differ from mine. A boss is supposed to test a player's skill, encompassing everything taught to the player. We get one boss fight. And it's not even that good. For Chica, you go down into the sewers and scamper around a little bit. Yep, definitely not a boss fight. For Roxy, you do 20 billion fetch quests only to watch a 15 second cutscene of the game doing the fun part for you. Yep, definitely not a boss fight. You prance around on top of Monte Golf by shooting literal balls into a bucket until... You guessed it, it does the fun part for you. The Monty fight is definitely the closest to a boss, but even calling them mini bosses would be extremely generous. Monty comes the closest, but it feels like a strange encounter than anything else. Since this section cannot last any longer, let's talk about the progression. And yep, it's pretty bad. It's all over the place in terms of pace and direction. So at first, you go through the game room by room, learning its mechanics throughout it all, and then the entire pizza plex becomes open for you to figure out what you're supposed to do. Okay, this has got to to be one of the most confusing games I have ever played, and I played Paper Mario Sticker Star. The game gives you vague ideas on what to do, and sure, they might drop a hint in one of the logs you find throughout the pizza plex, but you're all out of luck if you don't scamper for hints. There aren't many hints anyways. Adding little story markers on the map, like something is on this floor, would go a long way. Roughly on the same topic, you'll unlock both the Fazer Blaster and Fazcam, making this game lose any momentum. These two items are used to stun animatronics, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of the game. Find one of the buggers chasing you, and bam, threat annihilated. Just like, really? You're going to design a whole stealth system and have not only be ineffective, but virtually get phased out due to very overpowered alternatives? Okay, now it's time to go through a rapid fire of points that don't really warrant explaining or fleshing out into greater detail. 1. Freddy and friends get eroded over time as the game progresses. This is a visual thing, but it has zero time to the gameplay and is never explained moving on. Two, the cameras feel really slow and clunky. Three, you have to hold down the E key for five seconds to save, which gets annoying really fast. Four, the game has collectibles, but like, they're just PNGs. I can't even spin them around. It's just sad. Five, the animatronics have personalities, which... Ugh. The whole point of the original is that the creepy eeriness of all the robots and their silent yet faint noises is what gives them their own life. Nah, here, Steel Wool just made Roxy a bitch. 6. After you beat the main adventure and continue after 6am, the game decides to disable all saves. Really? Can you explain the game design behind this steel wool? 7. The moon guy is underutilized. What a shame. Also, this maze is the worst puzzle I have ever had to solve in a video game. Why does it have to be this way? Before we start this section, I must give the warning that any bug and performance issues are regarding when the game initially launched. I am well aware of the multitude of updates Steel Wool has been pumping out and I will be sure to address them. However, this video has been in the making for a long time and my experience and the footage associated with it is months old. You can make the argument that some of my points aren't validated because of this and to that I say, you're wrong. This was my experience of the game that I paid for at full price 
and expecting it to be fixed half a year later, much after I had any desire to play the game, should still warrant any criticism I give the game because for many months this is the version Steelwool had presented to their customers. And when I talk about updates, I'm more referring to the June patch. The script for this video had been completed before its release, and therefore I had not accounted for any changes it brings. I do account for the February patch, and I'll be sure to go over that. Cool? Alright, with that out of the way, the visuals were an immediate topic of discussion when this game was first revealed. Like look at this trailer, we go from stinky 2D to the next dimension. Not only that, but it looked like a next gen title. It looked like it was utilizing the next generation of hardware, and it also looked like a lie. I mean, I think the game looks pretty good, all things considered, but you cannot deny. The trailers definitely looked better than the final release, except for the ball pit scene. I see you commenters trying to pick apart what I say, so in the final game, what can I say about it? Yeah, it's pretty good. And I hate to sound like a broken record, but I just gotta put a handful of asterisks next to that statement. On the positive end of things, the realism this world goes for is achieved. The 80s neon lights aesthetic and art scattered all around the mall, from cardboard cutouts to posters advertising the activities and locations of the mall. So this sounds absolutely great. Why is the small an 80s theme? Time to pull off the old Luigi's Mansion 3 complaint, but it's too bright. There are very few sections in this game where it's pitch black and by god that is a problem. I can freaking see what's on the other side of the moon with this graphical choice. Also, remember when I said I liked all the art around the building? Yeah, well, I only like some of the art and there are certain sections you can tell where they were trying to cut corners. For example, look at this wall. What is this supposed to be? They took the teaser on Scott's website and smacked it on the wall. Dare I say it, but it literally looks like a PNG slapped onto the wall. Vending machines are a pretty common revenue source for many places. Oh my god. For these reasons, it kind of kills the realism for me. Textures are constantly low resolution. Now, during my second run, which is what I recorded for this video, I didn't capture many instances of textures wigging out. I'm also running this game on a supercomputer, which is the only way this game can work. Still, it's troubling that anything slightly subpar that I have, literally an RTX 3070 for crying out loud, won't run well. When I first played this game on my old machine, it struggled big time. Textures were constantly warping from an embarrassing 240p to a good enough standard. This leads me to my next point, how this game was far from being optimized. I know, real shocker, as it's the main thing people have been talking about when it comes to this game, but I have to mention it. This game chugs on not even lower end hardware, most hardware for that matter. Even the PS5, an exclusive for crying out loud, is slow. And then the PS4. Even on my RTX 3070, I got frequent stutters in my gameplay, and who could forget the 5 FPS cleanup bot? Though if we talk about optimization, I gotta talk about the bugs, and... Okay, so I've tried to sound as original as possible in my review, but come on. Honestly, in my opinion, not mentioning the bugs is kind of a disservice to the concept of a review. I am evaluating the final product of a game, not what it was supposed to be. This is what I bought at full price. When I listened to Daco's interview with some of the Steelwool developers, one of them stated, I was trying, so last night, I was trying to do a, like a comprehensive playthrough. Really? While playing the game, you could look past the bugs enough and ship it out, saying this was A-OK? -okay. You can easily find a security breach glitch compilation on YouTube. So for the sake of time, I'll just go over a couple of notable ones I ran into. Frankly, everyone's experience with this game is slightly different because the community constantly finds new bugs. Bugs I found include Chica teleporting right in front of me. While not necessarily a bug, it demonstrates the buggy and flawed game design. Jumping on any table makes any animatronic lose track of you somehow. Animatronics jump scaring with no animation. Monty going through the door and bolting at me, but not killing me. I love alligators, you know. In my first playthrough, I was able to get past the invisible wall in front of Monty Golf. Then I was able to complete it early and could actually save throughout. Monty just disappeared after dying a horrible death. Freddy can open any door he wants by going near it, which means you can access later parts of the game early or sections you weren't intended to see. I got teleported to a wall and got stuck somehow. Banny was frolicking around and then decided to bolt at me at 60 miles an hour and then proceeds to clip through the elevator. She also killed me while getting an ending. Who's ready to revolt? I don't want to dwell on this any longer because you all know it's terrible.
Goomba! But instead, you want to hear me talk about how I think the voice acting is actually pretty good. All the actors here do excellent performances. If we disregard the fact that giving the animatronics personalities is a bit of a weak design choice, the actual delivery of their lines is quite good, especially Kellen Gov. You can really tell he put his heart and soul into his performance and cared about Glamrock Freddy. It also made the Gregory and Glamrock Freddy connection a lot more enjoyable. Though, it is lame that all the animatronics besides Freddy have like four lines. When you get close to them, they spew out the same few sentences. And really, would it have really killed them to mix it up and have the voice actors record maybe 50 more words worth of dialogue? Unlike the voice acting, the music in this game is a uh, tad bland. This might be a hot take, but I was not really jumping out of my seat listening to this music. Look, FNAF games and music are kind of a weird relationship because the game doesn't really have traditional music that you might want to listen outside of the game. They are atmospheric tracks. Their goal is to fit the tone of the mood. And in my opinion, previous games have masterfully done this. Have a listen. Let's put it this way, the more traditional tracks are better than previous games, while the atmospheric tracks are much weaker. Though the addition of clock and ticking noises is a really cool touch that I'm surprised hasn't been done already. Have a quick listen. On the disappointing side though, quite a few good tracks were cut from the game, including the one I just played. Remixes of previous FNAF games' music appear in the files, and while I don't know where they would have fit in the game, man, the remix of Sister Location's Custom Night music is a banger. But if you thought music was the tip of the iceberg for cut content, then oh ho ho! There have been enough people that have gone and shown off the cut content in this game, which is why I'll gloss over it. But I'll leave a link to Tetrabit Gaming's video on the subject matter, and and a link to the Cutting Room Floors page about the game. So, now you might be saying, well, Steel will release a patch. It improved the game quite a bit, and you got to give it a third chance. <sighs> Yeah, so I did the unthinkable and played Security Breach for the third time. Go figure, I mean, not to mention that the game still has a handful of bugs, but the core game design is still the same, therefore the base experience is still a chore to go through. It's not really worth going over all the changes they made, but I'll highlight just one in particular. After the patch, players are now allowed to save after passing 6am using the save station in the middle of the map. Guys, this doesn't fix the problem. If I'm in the middle of a mission like Monty Golf, what, am I supposed to run across the map and save and run all the way back? Please, Steel Wolf, this is simply basic game design. All right, so right when completing this script, Steel Wolf had pumped out another bug fix update. And no, I will not be playing this game for a fourth time. Same sentiment still applies in my opinion, but this is a good opportunity to talk about how long these patch notes are. I thought the February patch was long, but you haven't seen anything if you don't read the June patch notes. It's longer than all seven Harry Potter books combined. I mean, what else do you want me to say? Good job, Steel Wolf, for completely fixing your game seven months months after its launch. A lot of these are good updates, yeah. Okay, maybe except for the added in more staff bots to patrol after the player acquires the security upgrade. So yeah, the patch helps, but security breach is still very flawed at its core. Also, Steel Wool's logo is a different size on the PS4 and PS5 box art. Well, damn. I always come back. In my humble opinion, I've been pretty fair in my assessment regarding this game. Breaking down the pure mechanical elements of the game is just what I do. It is how a lot of you all started watching me initially. However, FNAF Security Breach, well, it broke me, to say the least. Now, this section will be centered on the game story. As I warned you at the beginning of the video, I don't have time to catch you up. Hence, hopefully, you have a basic understanding of what's been going on. I'll still provide context and reference earlier games as reminders though. Now, without getting 
getting too into it, this game's story is mainly told through text. Scattered around the map are notes for you to pick up, most of which are employee annoyances that reveal the typical Fazbear Entertainment shenanigans that occur in each game. This is pretty weak as it goes against a fundamental design principle in previous FNAF games. While we certainly don't see everything, we get to see what goes down a lot of the time. We got to see a child get killed outside of Freddy's in FNAF 2. We saw the FNAF 4 kid get chomped at the ending of that game, and we got to know the hell that Henry put William to. Even with seeing this all, do we know what this all means? We have theories, but we still don't know. Every good story shows us details, but not enough to satisfy us. Show don't tell Steel Wool, so the fact that the game is littered with just text that supposedly happened at the Pizza Plex is fine, but why should I care? I like the mystery of Glamrock Bonnie, but just saying he disappeared one day really doesn't give us a lot to work with. It doesn't create any connection with me to want to solve the mystery of Glamrock Bonnie. And then we get to Vanessa. Oh, Vanessa. In classic FNAF style, we don't really know a lot about this character, but even then, her introduction is weird. Think back to FNAF VR. Theorists had concluded that the game's ending had William Afton, aka Glitchtrap, possess Vanessa and went from a computer virus to becoming the host of a body. Notice how we switch places with the player character, a beta tester for this game. As revealed by the tapes and in the ending to the Curse of Dreadbear DLC, we hear one side of a conversation of someone receiving or being commanded orders. No. There's no miscommunication. I understand. This makes me think William Afton used Vanessa almost as a host, literally acting like a virus in real life and sucking its host for all it's worth. Now jump back to Security Breach. And William is back! We'll get there in a moment. There is no mention of Glitch Trap, but Vanessa is still evil somehow. Obviously, Vanny and Vanessa are the same person, but her connection with William is utterly lost in this game, and the endings of this game don't make things any better. Security Breach surprisingly has a lot of endings, most of which are are pretty bad. Many of them have this comic book style that is beyond sheep and, dare I say it, looks bad. They also abruptly happen with no build up to them at all. Some of them are also nicely animated, which makes every ending feel incoherent and disconnected from one another. But now, I lead you to the fire ending, because, you know, it's FNAF. Freddy kills Vanessa in what I would say to be an epic sacrifice, but the ugly art kind of masks the tension this scene could have formed, all to reveal that there are are two Vanessas at the very end. Now, disregarding the jumping the shark implications this all has, many online theorists have deduced that this has to be symbolic. That Vanessa, because of her history with Freddy and the gang, her spirit is trapped in this stupid mall. Looking down as the fire burns behind her symbolizes how her soul is attached to the pizza plex. How because of her connection to William Afton and being a security guard at the place, she never truly got a satisfying conclusion. Her spirit wasn't set free, even though we clearly see how spirits in FNAF 3 can be put to rest through fire, it apparently doesn't work like that in this instance. To put it bluntly, this is dumb. Symbolism is a tricky topic, and I feel like Steel Wool wanted to put a big fat mystery on our plate and just no. This all reminds me of the Bite of 83 and Bite of 87 debates which were clearly not supposed to be a talking point as it once was. Want me to prove my own point? Look at FNAF's Twitter poll about whether Vanny and Vanessa are different people. 40% of respondents think they are different people. That's a shocking number considering that three games, Help Wanted, Special Delivery, and Security Breach, all want you to believe that Vanny and Vanessa are the same. But can I really blame them? There really isn't a right or wrong. And of course, as previously mentioned, Fanny and Vanessa just barely appear in this game. This game just screams Rush, and the early promotional material proves my point. Think back to that old Vanessa teaser on Scott's website. The wording of protect implies we would be playing as her. She is the focal point of the image and just screams, I am protagonist. If we want to get an even deeper look, look at this leaked poster for the game way back in the early leaks of the game. Vanessa is the focal point and right behind her is good old Vanny. Could it be that initially they were supposed to be two separate characters? If you want my honest answer, yes, I really think that. This could have been the opportunity to start fresh for the series, to blossom a new generation of stories. But no, they did the same thing that Scott's been doing for years now. But none of this compares to the single worst thing to happen to this series. Think back to FNAF 6. Henry, William Afton's right hand man, has finally wanted to end his partner's reign of terror once and for all. He built the FNAF 
have six location all as a trap to lure the current souls still out there. All to burn the place down at the end of the game to kill off the horrors of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. In this game, the grand final ending has the player going underground to find the FNAF 6 location still intact. So, who's ready for Dane to get pissed? So like, what? Why does this need to happen? Why is this location so deep underground? Also, when you walk inside the building, why is this place even up? When a building burns down, you know what it turns into? Ashes, and as Gru told us in Despicable Me, It has been disintegrated. By definition, it cannot be fixed. The building is still up and even has electricity in some capacity. But then, if you thought that was bad, things get way worse as we head down to this giant creepy hole that somehow formed. Did the underminer from The Incredibles go down? down here or something. After Freddy has a little existential crisis, we meet this. Oh my god. Now let us go back to FNAF 6. Henry, who set the whole building to the ground. If you ask me, his speech and that game's ending is the single greatest thing from this franchise. It was the perfect end cap to the series. All the animatronics in one place left to burn. Their spirits would be set free to rest. As Henry said, And give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. It was the ultimate sacrifice and put a nice bow on everything. But now, four years later, we see that all tossed away for a barely burnt down building and a creature that has no sense in existing. It would be one thing to have all the FNAF 6 guys down here, but Funtime Freddy's mask, this blob character here is clearly supposed to be a freakishly large version of Molten Freddy, an amalgamation of all the spirits of Funtime Freddy, Funtime Foxy, and Ballora. But if this is supposed to still be Molten Freddy, which I guarantee it it is, why is it Funtime Freddy's mask? How does a mask decorode? And of course, we have other animatronics like Baby. Again, not Scrap Baby, but regular Baby. The puppet with no tear tracks, okay. And FNAF 1 Chica, because apparently she didn't have her spirit set free at the end of FNAF 3. This here doesn't sit with me. This whole idea that FNAF 6's building could just not burn to the ground had to be a stretch. So I went digging and searched hard. I pulled a map pet and found something that even some hardcore FNAF fans didn't know. Well, that part probably technically isn't true. I'm not that active on the subreddit. Some people probably already found this, but you know what? I'm gonna claim that I found it. And I'll tell you where I found it. In the updated strategy guide for Five Nights at Freddy's. I know, like really? This book. This simple strategy guide for young children also has a T-posing spring bonnie. This is what is tying up all the loose ends. And to all of that, I say yes. On page 224, when talking about incidents that relate to the ongoing Stitch Wraith story, the book draws a parallel to the fire at the end of FNAF 6 by stating, quote, the incidents shown in Pizzeria Simulator and its aftermath are revisited via police evidence. It seems that Cassette Man's plan did not work exactly as intended. I know this is a silly little strategy guide, and is anything in here technically canon? No. But I believe this is the likely explanation. It would seem odd and far-fetched, but for this book to specifically call it out was almost my breaking point. To completely disregard the sacrifice Henry made really devalues everything he did. It's a frustrating retcon because Scott's initial intention needed to be readjusted to continue the Afton storyline. However, this is just the beginning. Gregory and Freddy fall even deeper through the ground and we get a nice little cutscene moving us through the vents to show that, yep, he's back. Remember a while ago when I said William is back in a different form? Yeah, he's just Springtrap again. How is he able to go from circuit board to living flesh is beyond me. Now, I'm not going to explain the fight because it's terrible. It's a prolonged and repetitive boss where you just run back and forth, pressing buttons trying to burn Afton. Until... Oh no, he goes away again. Dang gummit, we'll get him next time. Though the cutscene is very well animated, even if it's only 15 seconds. My main problem with this is that he did not need to return. Going back to my original point of Henry and his sacrifice, that whole speech of his is totally ruined. Fanny was this franchise's opportunity to blossom, to tell a new tale, to leave William in hell from Ultimate Custom Night and move on. Even if they were persistent in pursuing William, they still did him dirty. Remember Remember way back when I was mentioning the trailers for this game? That first gameplay trailer had ominous voices throughout it. It was pretty apparent that the first one was William Afton, referring to the digital conscious transference from FNAF VR. When I first found you, you were nothing. You were small, 
But wait a second, if that's William Afton, then why isn't PJ Haywood voicing him? Can we all appreciate PJ Haywood's performance just for one moment? He delivered a performance that sounded like a person, yet sounded like a monster. What a deceptive calling. I knew it was a lie the moment I heard it, obviously. But it is intriguing nonetheless. So PJ Haywood does not return to his role, and I'm going to say it now, the new Afton voice sucks. There is no attempt at a British accent, and he sounds evil for the sake of being evil. Also, no one knows why PJ Haywood was replaced, so that's always fun. But who was that second voice in the trailer? You will do as I say! You will bring me what I want! I can easily answer that with this clip. When I first found you... You were small, pathetic, but now you are more. Are you ready to play some Five Nights at Freddy's, enjoy Security Breach, and remember, you will do as I say, you will bring me what I want, and if you don't, you will burn! So there's that. Now, this is fascinating. It not only reveals that Matthew Curtis, a Music Man fame, who ironically enough does not voice Music Man in Security Breach, was the replacement for Afton. In addition, it reveals that the voice in the trailer was the same character, which is dumb. They don't even sound the same. Even worse though, is that clip I just showed you. Look how happy he is to be announcing alongside Steel Wool about the game's release. He looked proud of his work, and even if I don't like his William voice, I can respect that. But Steel he will cut all of his lines, so who cares? William Afton is just a mess. His voice is different, and his new lines were cut entirely. I didn't even talk about his design, which... Nah. It's an improvement over Scrap Trap's Minecraft looking chest, so I'll give it that. Now, what could be worse than FNAF 6's location coming back, Molten Freddy's mask not appearing, and the Spring Boy himself dying to fire again? Well, it's one room. Using the Faz Cam down in one of the basement floors by flashing the wall reveals. Well, it reveals something, alright. Gives me 395246 vibes. Flashing the wall unlocks a secret room, which for many of you, this should bring bring back memories of Michael Afton's room at the end of every night in Sister Location. This one room is the epitome of why this game failed. Now, you are likely sitting there questioning yourself about my credibility at this point, but hang in there with me just a little longer. Before we get to the main issue, let me talk about some other stuff in this room. The code with the secret message was a pretty cool community effort. It's really classic cryptic FNAF. There are these CDs of therapy tapes, which against you will show don't tell. However, the room itself and the idea of it being a replica of Michael Afton's room proves there is a clear lack of direction and communication from both Scott and Steel Wool. Two differing minds going at it with two very different viewpoints. Don't believe me? Remember that interview Daco did with Steel Wool? So as we're, as, you know, as we're building the game, uh, you know, I get an email from Scott. And he says, hey, put this stuff in the game. And I, 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 I look at it all. I, 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 I examine it as a producer would do, and I say, I have no idea what any of this means. This sounds harmless enough, but that stuff executive producer Ray is commenting on, I believe one of those things is this room. Now, why does this matter? Well, Steel Wool is trying to create a game with a new story, and Steel Wool needs to be able to interconnect every part of their game to the existing story they want to tell. If they put Springtrap back in the game, it has to do with what they want. There is a reason they did that. But if my theory is correct, and the fact that the Michael Afton room is something Steel Wool was instructed to add, well, they are just as confused as we are. Look at what Ray said. He specifically pointed out how certain elements they added through Scott's request had them just as baffled as we are. So because of this, this short little quote leads me to believe in a disconnect from a story perspective. How are we supposed to piece something together from two different minds? And that is the true secret and horror behind Fire. Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. This disconnection between Scott and Steel Wool proves that 
at least from a storytelling perspective, they aren't on the same page. And think about it, Ray mentioned stuff, which implies multiple things. What is an Easter egg coming from Scott's mind and what is an Easter egg coming from Steel Wool's mind is a blurry picture. This is why Security Breach feels so frustrating from a lore perspective, because it feels directionless. This is when storytelling fails. It feels like most of this game is just red herrings. What is the true ending of the game? Are multiple endings technically canon all at the same time? When will Danarite shut up and just move on? Do I even need to say it? Security Breach is my least favorite video game I have ever played. Not that it's the worst game I've ever played, far from it. However, what it stands for is undeniably insulting to gaming and this franchise. I can't even blame only Steel Wolf for this. It has been confirmed that Scott had a lot of say in this game, having to approve certain concept ideas to see them come into reality. And I'm certainly not the only person who feels this way. Look at Markiplier assessing his playthrough of the game. As frustrated as I can get, it doesn't mean that I dislike the game. Because there is, like, love put into a lot of the corners of this game. There's not a lot of polish in some places, and the experience overall feels a little disconnected. And I was talking about it before, how it almost seems like there's another game that was here originally and it didn't come fully true. It's almost hard to watch as he pieces together the words to nicely say the game was buggy and unfinished. MatPat, in his playthrough, had comments about some of the cut corners this game endured. I wonder if they were all meant to be animated, like, or uh, 3D animated, because you had the, the one with, with William Afton, that was clearly done. I wonder if the intent was for all of them to be done that way, but then it just got to the point where it's like, well, we gotta push out this game and that takes a lot of time and effort, so nope. Then, of course, who could forget Phil Morg's legendary tweets absolutely destroying the game and everything it stands for. Even the smallest of details were overlooked, apparently. It's pretty sad that I had to go into the game's files to turn on freaking VSync. This is a pretty standard and universal feature, mind you, and should be the bare minimum of any options menu. And before you even mention it, this is the time where I awkwardly include a talking point that came up after writing the bulk of the script. So Steel Wool just recently announced DLC for this game. And if I didn't mention it, I'm sure I would have received a couple of comments about it. First, I think it looks fine. It's just a piece of concept art. So until I see an actual screenshot or gameplay, I won't be on the edge of my seat. Uh, I think the name is really lame though. Ruin just seems like basic and well, not fun. Finally, I want to mention how people have praised Steel Wool announcing this quite a bit after the game came out, meaning they must have had some internal meetings about whether to make DLC instead of announcing it ahead of time. Uh, guys? You do realize a DLC button icon existed in the game's files when the game first launched? You cannot tell me they weren't at the very least planning or brainstorming anything related to the DLC. Will we ever get DLC? A security breach so that is something that we're talking about right now um so we're we're starting to make some plans um there's nothing concrete yet um but we've got a lot of ideas we're collaborating with scott on it they are smart enough to have realized that the backlash would have been mountainous if they announced it ahead of time so i don't buy it speaking of buying making it free is a nice bonus after charging 40 bucks for the base game it likely would have felt a little insulting having to pay again for something that probably should have been in the base game look the state of FNAF is looking dire, to say the least. The Fazbear Fanverse initiative is a whole can of worms I am definitely not going to get into, but it has been unorganized, to say the least. If you want more information, I recommend reading this Polygon article. Click Team's console ports, god, I literally hate these things. They put giant distracting button controls, and did you know sister location on console was basically broken for the longest time? If you see a cursor in any console game, just run. Remember having to type in lol in Sister Location's custom night, where instead of pressing the screen, you could just type it on your keyboard? Try doing that with the controller. It's not fun. And guess how long they took to fix this on PS4? Just guess. A year? Yep. Woo! FNAF was at an all-time high, and Steel Wool totally blew it. Unless you count the millions of views of speedrunners having a field day with this game, please don't buy this game. Look, 
I complain about these things not because I want to be the bearer of bad news, far from it. I pride myself on mainly producing more positive slash neutral reviews, going over the history and final outcomes of a wide range of games. But this one was it. This one broke me. Despite all the red flags of troubled development and lack of gameplay leading up to the launch, I had hoped that Security Breach could close the book on the Afton storyline and introduce a whole new set of characters and fun scenarios to unpack. The key word in that last sentence was fun, if you missed that. Alas, that was simply a far off thought. So to go back to my opening question, why do people love FNAF? The answer is quite simple, it's simplicity. But that doesn't mean simple things can't have depth. FNAF was full of depth. For new and old fans alike, there was something to get out of it. And when you remove that, well, the rest is history. everyone, this is Yummy Mesh and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's. It's like my guide, it's like a good guy. Fredbear seems a good guy. Oh 